Hello everybody, my name is Brandon De Silva. I work at OP Trust as an Associate Portfolio Manager and today we're going to be talking about Bayesian machine learning and specifically how we can use that for uncertainty modeling and in fact why do we even care about uncertainty modeling. We're going to start off by talking about Bayesian Q learning and then we're going to move into how we can apply this to your investment strategy. And lastly we're going to broaden up a bit and also talk about supervised learning specifically how we can use Bayesian deep learning to improve forecasting. So let's just get right into it. We're going to start off with um, Bayesian Q learning, but specifically we're going to start off with Q learning because we need to understand this before we can move into the Bayesian portion of things. Now I think a lot of you will be familiar with Q learning, but this is sort of a recap for those who are not. So there's the first concept we have to understand is this concept of a total return denoted with G. And essentially what it is, it's the summation of future discounted rewards, where the rewards are discounted by some factor gamma, which ranges between 0 and 1, where 0 is super myopic and 1 is very farsighted. And so the first thing I'll note, and this will come back in a minute or two, is that when we set gamma equal to 0, what's going to happen is all of the rewards, except for the first reward, are going to have a weight of 0. And so essentially, the total return is equal to the reward at the first time step. Okay, just keep that in mind, it'll come back very soon. Right here is just the compact representation of the formulation above. And lastly, this is what we really care about, right? This concept of a Q value, because this is what we're trying to learn in Q learning. And essentially what it is, it's the expected value of the total return given some state in action. And you can choose the state in action to be whatever you want, um, the state is some market environment, for example, and the action can be either going long or short an asset, or it can be something a little less discrete, maybe like a continuous allocation in a portfolio. And so what you want to learn with Q-learning is the Q-values for various actions in a state, such that when you're in a state, you can calculate the Q-value for all the different actions you can take and simply select the maximum Q-value, because that will give you the maximum total return going forward. It sounds pretty easy, doesn't it? But there's a few nuances um, that I'm going to get back to a bit later um, to show that maybe you want to incorporate a distribution of Q values instead of just a point estimate. So how are Q values actually distributed? I'm going to make the argument that in the financial markets we can assume that Q values are normally distributed and I'm going to be using the central limit theorem to kind of rationalize this. For those who are unfamiliar with what the central limit theorem is, it basically states that given some underlying distribution, it doesn't have to be a normal distribution, if you take a sample from this distribution and then take a mean and do this multiple times, that those sample means are normally distributed. And if you think back to when I was just describing a Q-value, it's simply a sample sum, right? Now, a sample sum is just an unscaled sample mean. So therefore, if sample means we can assume are normally distributed, then we can also assume the same for sample sums. But there are a few variables that we have to keep in mind, which I'm going to talk about. Um, but after I go through these, you guys will kind of also realize that we can also assume that Q values are normally distributed in the financial markets. So um, there's a few things that I want to toggle over here. The first is n, which is just the number of time steps. The next is gamma, which is the discount factor that we already discussed. And this other one is this concept of sparsity. Um, I'm not going to talk about it now. I'll refer to it closer to the end of this of this slide. Uh, and, and I say slide, like these aren't actually slides. It's a front-end interface that I designed from scratch. Um, but I'm just going to be referring to them as slides. So um, before I, I actually start explaining why and how each of these affects the distribution. First, I'll kind of walk through the visuals. The light distribution here is the underlying reward distribution. The darker distribution is the Q value distribution, and the star indicates the effective number of time steps. And the reason why this is important is because you can think about this as the sample size in central limit theorem. We need a decent enough sample size to make the assumption that the sample means are normally distributed. For example, Imagine the sample size was 1, then the sample mean is just equal to the sample, right? And in that case, the sample means you cannot assume are normally distributed. They're 
perfectly distributed according to the underlying distribution, right? Um, and so that's the first distinction I want to make. And the reason why that's important is if you look down here, you can immediately realize why time steps and discount factor are important because if you have a discount factor of zero, remember what I said before. When you have a discount factor of zero, all rewards except for the first reward are going to get a weight of zero. And so the total return is equivalent to the first reward. Therefore, we can assume that the Q value will be distributed according to the underlying distribution of the reward. And so in this case, if the underlying distribution is not normally distributed, we cannot assume that Q values are normally distributed either. This is not the case when you increase gamma and the gamma approaches one. Now we can assume that Q values are normally distributed given a large enough N, right? Because our sample size is large. And if the sample size is large, then the sample sum will be approximately normally distributed, as we see here. And you can actually dive into this a bit more um, on my article that I have on my blog. I actually do a full analysis on this. You can link to the Google Collab Notebook. And I have multiple statistical tests to also show that these are normally distributed when these things hold true. Uh, and this is also true for a Bernoulli distribution. Like as you decrease gamma and increase it, you see that it moves away and back to normal distribution. Uh, same thing for the number of time steps. So these hold no matter what the underlying distribution, assuming you have a finite variance and mean. But if you do, um, then I think it's safe to assume that Q values are normally distributed in the financial markets because of the fact that we have a long time horizon, right? The number of time steps is much larger than even 87, right? And like, it doesn't matter what time scale you even operate on, right? Like if you imagine you operate on a daily time horizon and you receive rewards technically at every single second or every single minute. And so that'll create a large enough number of time steps to assume that Q values are normally distributed. And we can just set gamma to whatever we want, right? So we can set it to like 0.99. Um, and this will help us uh, with the assumption that Q values are normally distributed and we can model it in such a way. And the reason why we would want to do this is because it helps a lot for modeling. Like if we're directly trying to model Q value distribution, then we have an analytical solution for the posterior, uh, which I'll get to very soon. And even if we're doing something more complex, like have a function approximation, when we assume normality, we can actually solve it with like trying to minimize KL divergence very nicely, which it might be a bit harder to do if we do not assume a normal distribution. So that's why it's great that it is normally distributed and we can do a lot of cool modeling things because that's the case. Oh, and, and actually before we move on to the next slide, I mentioned this concept of sparsity. I'll quickly get back to it before moving on, but it's not as important for us. Um, because rewards in the financial markets are not sparse, at least in the public markets, at least, they're not sparse. We receive a reward at every single time step. Um, but the reason I included this is because for certain other domains like games, it's not the case. And so there can be a, a situation where like, let's say like this equal 15. So like in this case, it'd mean that every 15 time steps, um, you will receive a reward. But in between the 15 time steps, you are going to deterministically re receive a reward of zero. In that case, um, when n equals 30, you really only receive two rewards, right? Like you, the sample size is not actually 30 when 28 of them are deterministically zero. Uh, so that's just one little nuance, but we don't have to worry about that since we get immediate feedback all the time in public markets, which is awesome. Great, so let's get into the Bayesian interpretation. So the first thing we have to do is define the update rule using using Bayes' theorem. And so we, we know that we can define it as such, where it's the likelihood times the prior. And this is what the update rule looks like for mu and sigma squared when we assume that the distributions are normally distributed. Now, if you're familiar with the update rule for Q-learning, you'll realize that the update for mu looks a lot like the update for Q-learning. And it actually has a beautiful interpretation if you think about it, because Q is almost like your your prior estimate of the Q value. And this over here, the reward that you receive from the environment plus your next estimate is almost like 
the, your evidence, right? Like this is like the likelihood. And so what that means is that the alpha or the learning rate that you apply to this new information, it's basically similar to your relative uncertainty in your prior relative to the likelihood. And so what that means is as you become more and more certain in your prior, you need to rely less and less on new information that comes in. And that's one of the beautiful interpretations that, that you can have if you look at Q learning through the lens of a Bayesian. Now there's a lot to talk about with this, uh, and I go into it deeply into uh, in my blog, and so you're, you're happy to dive in a bit more there, but we have a lot of material to cover over here. And so one last interpretation that I want to show you guys um, is the interpretation of what happens when you assume a constant alpha or a constant learning rate which is what happens a lot, although some people do decay the learning rate, and I'll get to that in a second, but when you assume a constant learning rate, um, what happens is you're implicitly increasing the variance of your prior right before the Bayesian update, okay? So I'll show you what I mean by that. So let's say um, I just increased the, the learning rate to have like relatively comparable levels of uncertainty and the likelihood in the prior just to kind of really drive the visual home. So let's say we calculate the posterior. At first, they'll kind of look the same. Now watch what happens as I calculate the posterior again. I want to focus your attention here, and then we're going to move here after. But if you notice here, um, the posterior becomes the prior, and then we, we draw over a new posterior. But nothing really happens to the prior. Versus if you look on the right-hand side, as the posterior becomes the prior, we are expanding the variance, right? We are increasing uncertainty. And this is the implicit transformation that happens when we assume a constant alpha, because we are saying that no matter how much new information we get, we are never becoming more certain in our prior relative to the likelihood. Now, I'm not saying which approach is better, um, but I think it's important to keep that in mind, the implicit assumption that's happening when you have certain hyperparameters in your model. So that's kind of the high level of Bayesian Q learning. Now I'm actually going to get into how to use this stuff in practice. Um, very simply, like we have some set of inputs, which as before I mentioned, this can be our definition of the state. We have some machine learning model. It can be whatever you want it to be. I, I like using function approximators for various reasons. Um, if you're interested to know why, you can reach out to me. I'm, I'm happy to answer any questions. Um, and so, and then you have some actions, right? And your actions can be a lot of different things, but for this case, let's say we have three assets in our investable universe, and we want to decide which asset to allocate to, right? This is a discrete choice. We, we're not making a portfolio. We're either allocating to asset one, two, or three. And so what we can do is we can generate Q-value distributions. And now we can in invest in the one that has the highest expected return and the lowest variance, right? or in other words, the highest risk-adjusted return. And so in different states, we're going to have different outputs. Um, and so this is actually a great example. Um, so if you look at asset number one and asset number three, they have very similar means, but the variance in asset number three is a lot more than the variance in asset number one. And so on a risk-adjusted basis, I would prefer asset number one. And that's one of the nuances I wanted to show you guys is that if you just use point estimates of Q values, you wouldn't be able to get this nuance in your analysis. And so asset number one and asset number three would look basically identical from a return perspective. But if you incorporate uncertainty, then I think it's clear that asset number one is the better choice. Um, and another thing you can do if you don't want to just have discrete allocations is you can have something a bit more continuous and use some heuristic to say, okay, I know what the expected returns are, I know what the uncertainty is, I can do like some sharp ratio type of thing with the return over uncertainty and then allocate accordingly, right? So maybe this gets, I don't know, 50% of the allocation, this one gets 30% and this one gets 20%, something like that. I know this is not complete, it doesn't take into account covariance, but it's one heuristic that you can use or to at least reframe how you think about using uncertainty in your portfolio. And lastly, uh, 
Um, imagine we just replace asset number one, asset number two, and asset number three with strategy one, strategy two, and strategy three. And so you have a broader strategy that has sub-strategies, and you want to decide which strategy to allocate to within a certain regime, right? So now your input, right, your state or your representation of the environment is some regime, and your actions are which strategy do you allocate in this regime. And this is really important, right, because like different strategies do well in different market conditions. And so what we're doing here is we're getting a distribution of how well we think it's going to do in various regimes and we can make very informed decisions when we know the uncertainty in how well this thing does in the regime. Um, so those are a few applications of Bayesian Q learning to your investment program. And now I'm going to talk a bit more broadly about Bayesian deep learning, specifically forecasting, and how we can use that to also improve decision making in the investment process. So now we're specifically looking at the problem of forecasting, right? So here is some historical time series, and then we feed it into our model. And what we're doing is we're forecasting some path going forward. Um, but with a probabilistic model or a Bayesian model, what we're able to do is forecast um, a distribution of paths, right? And, and here I can overlay the probability density function. And you can clearly see that this one has, for example, a positive mean. Uh, and if it wasn't apparent, this dotted red line is like the break-even, right? So it's a return of zero. And, and that's also what it was in the last slide, but, but I think that was apparent. But I just figured I'd mention it right now. So why is this important? Well, as I mentioned before, if you just use point estimates, you're only aware of the mean, and you're unaware of the model's uncertainty. And so two predictions that inherently look the same are fundamentally different because the model is very certain in one versus uncertain in the other. And I'll, I'll show you what I mean by this. For example, let's say your model is very uncertain and the distribution of paths looks something like this, right? Even though it has a slight positive mean, I think the uncertainty is so large that it's not worth it to make this trade. On the other hand, if you are very certain, then even though it has the same exact mean, the uncertainty is way smaller. And on a risk-adjusted basis, this trade is much better than the previous trade, right? The majority of the probability density is above zero. And so for the most part, this looks like a pro uh, profitable trade. If in fact the machine was right that this was actually the uncertainty. Um, and so this is very important to understand because like I mentioned before, if you just use point estimates, you really miss this aspect of forecasting. And so I'm going to show you another application of this. And the previous one is just, um, you can just enter trades that have a high risk adjusted return uh, and you can scale them accordingly based on how uncertain you are. You can put a smaller position size and if you're more certain, a higher position size. Um, but here I'm going to show you a slightly different application using a similar concept. Uh, basically, this will tell you when to get out of a trade. And so if you look here, the gray distribution here is like some threshold that you have to say, this is too risky. Uh, I don't feel comfortable staying in the trade. And this teal distribution is your predicted forecasted distribution, right? And so what you can do is if you're in a trade, you can monitor how uncertain your model is in forward looking predictions. And so as the uncertainty increases, it, you can stay in the trade so long as it doesn't cross the threshold. Once it crosses the threshold, and it's indicated with this red distribution, then you can say, okay, I've had enough. This is too uncertain. I'm liquidating the position. And I'll wait until such a time where I'm more certain to enter the position again, if I find it attractive from a return to risk perspective. Uh, so that's just another application of how you can use distributions. Um, there's a lot more, but that's kind of all I had for you guys today. And I hope you enjoyed and if you want to learn a bit more, feel free to reach out to me on LinkedIn. I'm happy to answer any questions.